Well, it's been quite the year for indie horror games, huh? Hello neighbours. <laughs> uh, never mind. Uh, Baldi has a remastered edition and doesn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. And Poppy Playtime looks great visually and seems pretty genuinely fun gameplay wise. Damn it. You can't keep getting away with it! And that's just barely scratching the surface. There's so much more happening at the moment. It's practically a second renaissance of the whole thing. And then there's the king and queen of this weird little subgenre Five Nights at Freddy's and Bendy. Now, that being said, uh, full admission, I played Bendy and the Ink Machine in 2019 on PS4, so the final version of the game from start to finish. No previous thoughts or knowledge of the franchise, completely blind. And it was fine. Meh gameplay, a story that's weird and intriguing at best, and completely scatterbrained and nonsensical at worst. But some really good creature designs, art style, musical score, and yes, intriguing lore carry it pretty hard. 5 out of 10 sex tops. And now I can talk about how incredible Bendy in the Dark Revival was. In a moment. Hey, Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> oh boy. Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach. I'm gonna keep this as brief as possible. I bought it, I played it, I liked and still like some parts of it. But I really didn't like a lot of others. The gameplay, the story, the uh, the uh... Okay, honestly that's pretty funny. But I'm certainly not alone in my feelings. It seems to be a pretty popular opinion, not unanimous. The security breach was an ambitious but ultimately failed attempt at a AAA FNAF game. With critics and fans alike ripping the poor thing apart. In contrast, Dark Revival has gotten shockingly good reviews from all rounds. And and I I was going into this expecting to make fun of the game and now I, I'm finding so little to actually make fun of. Like, to the point that I don't think anyone expected it to get as good as reviews as it did. So, we have two delayed games, both by far the biggest and most ambitious of their franchise so far, and many more similarities. How did one go so wrong and one so right? Let's find out. Security Breach was first teased in August 2019. After a long, long trickle of teasers and delays, the game was finally released in December 2021. Wow. For a series that's famous for doing everything from releasing games months early to straight up stealth dropping new main entries, an over two year wait between original teaser and final product was just unheard of. But hey, wouldn't matter if the game was big and beautifully in the end, right? Dark Revival was another matter entirely. First teased release 2019, but the date came and went, and immediately did something that was admittedly rather frustrating at the time, but I can appreciate in retrospect. He went, almost, radio silent throughout 2020, 2021, and most of 2022, and then, in the first two weeks of November, BAM! Trailer! BAM! Release date! BAM! A cascade of info wrenching the hype train up to 11 once again. Safe to say, I was excited for both of these games. And they tried their best when it came to marketing, both clearly had big issues behind the curtain, and I think they handled it as well as they could. The games themselves though? I've put it off long enough, let's talk about Five Minutes of Freddy's Security Breach and Bendy in the Dark Revival, and why one of them works so much better than the other. Honestly? This is likely going to be the quickest section, simply because it's the least I have to actually talk about. Dark Revival's gameplay is certainly not bad. It's a gigantic step up from the original, which I believe was always tied down from the fact that its very core was based around a thrown together weekend project that immediately never ever expected to explode in popularity. But the new studio strikes a good balance of explorability and more straightforward areas. Backtracking isn't much of a chore, and it actually feels rather metroidvanian at points. Audrey's powers are fun, the Ink Demon and Slicer make sure you're always on edge, and even the boss battles are a big step up. Really the only disappointment is the combat in general, which feels just 
okay, average, decent mids. You, you get the idea. Security breach is trickier. And honestly, I feel sorry for the programmers and designers. It's very clear they wanted something fun and different, yet recognisable for FNAF. It's just that nothing works. They clearly wanted stealth to be a factor. They focus heavily on distractions like these cans in both the beginning of the game, even the bloody trailer. And with a bit of tweaking, I always think the camera system could be really fun. The only trouble is that, 9 times out of 10, stealth is neither fun nor even necessary. The camera spying is too slow and disorientating to be really useful, and you're almost always better off just looking around an area yourself. You can't even use it to keep track of the main animatronics like how you do in the other games because of how they teleport around. Real shame. And then there's the star of the show. Not Freddy, the gargantuan Pizzaplex. It's a genuinely amazing thing for a team as small as Steel Wolves to have created in its sheer mass and details. But its greatest strength is also its greatest weakness. That wonderfully impressive size can make it a real chore to traverse. Especially if it's to grab one item and go right back to where you started. It's not like the map helps much. Oh no 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 no. And finally, do I have to mention the 6am save thing? I feel like I have to mention the 6am save thing. It's the one thing in this game that makes me think, maybe Security Breach isn't for kids because even adults find this ridiculously, stupidly difficult. And not in a fun way, in a dumb way. Like, it's bad enough, even today, with only one save point, requiring, again, a massive trek, but in its original released state, when you had to go through hours more without the possibility of saving? What bollocks was that? And still is to this day. I, I will never get that. First and foremost, the main protagonists, Gregory and Audrey. I don't think this will be a particularly controversial opinion, but the latter is just a far superior character all round. Here's the thing, Gregory is presented as a mystery. We are left to wonder what his deal is at the start of the game, how he escaped Vanny and or how he knows Vanessa is bad news, how he got into Freddy, etc. I don't know about the rest of you, but it seems like pretty clear-cut questions that would be answered by the game's finale. But they're just not. The strangeness of Gregory is never expanded on in-game, and he gets zero character debt for development besides the slightly snarky child. Audrey, on the other hand? At first, she isn't presented as a mystery, just a normal young woman and animator caught up in all this madness. In stark contrast to Gregory's constant bizarre confidence, her panic and fear make her instantly more relatable. And then we have a plot twist about her that really truly works. They could have just hand waved her having powers as, you know, she's the main character, the protagonist that we control. But they went the extra mile. And by the end of the game, we can see how she's changed and we've truly earned the confidence in her voice. Then we have the villains. Do I even have to talk about the villains? It's, it, it's comical. How superior Wilson and the Ink Demon are to Vanny and Burntrap. The latter two had an entire previous game and DLC and that mobile game to build up their appearance and relationship. If you were in the FNAF community at all in the last two years, you knew all about them going into this. They were even featured prominently in the trailer. So why does the game do nothing with them? More than that, why does it seem to treat Athens' return as this big grand revelation? Whoa! And at the same time make it feel so anti-hype. It's really impressive stuff. He's just... there. No fanfare at all. First and foremost though, Vanny. I can't lie, I was actually excited for this new character in the lead up to Security Breach. She looked pretty threatening from the trailers and, you know, it was a complex character. Complex we've seen in FNAF, okay? It was, the, the groundwork was there. So what happened? What people say is shockingly true, she has just about the same amount of screen time across the trailers as she does in the entirety of the actual game. And the vast majority of it is the first 20 minutes. They can't do anything interesting with her because they simply don't have the time to even try. And I don't have to mention the Afton's boss battle. I for one find it genuinely hilarious how there is a Dr. Doofenshmirtz style self-destruct button that, despite orchestrating this entire operation, 
the genius Afton decided to just leave intact. Bloody ludicrous. Oh, and what happened to Glitch Trap? I can understand why some might not be a fan, but I actually really like this new version of William. He was genuinely creepy and unique and weird in a good way for FNAF. There's only this tiniest little references to him in Security Breach and I can't lie when I say I was far more hyped for these than I was for Burn Trap. We really couldn't have anything more? Now, do you want a good example of expanding in the baddies? Look at the Dark Revival, look at it! The Inca Demon was a huge problem I had with the original game. He was kinda cool, I guess. But it was like the game refused to focus on him until I was actually forced to, it was out of options. And when it did, it went with the path of the least interest. Here though? Oh my goodness. He's intensely threatening and not to mention the intriguing Jekyll and Hyde concept that they actually expand on in game. And the slightest bit of sympathy by the end of it. They establish from the very first chapter that this is a very different demon. We truly understand why this world might be called that of the Ink Demons, and his new design? Of course, there is a lot more characters than just our protagonists and villains, but if I went over everyone we'd be here for hours, so I'll just say quickly. Roxy and Alice Angel are really good side antagonists, Sun and Porter are highlights of their respective games and it's a real shame they're only a minute for minuscule amounts. Monte and Chica are kind of boring. Music Man and Carly and Slash Slicer are awesome. I don't really have much to say about Alison or Vanessa. And oh yes, yeah, it's, it's very cool to see Joey and Henry again, the former being a very useful lore dumper and a genuinely intriguing entity. Joey was my favourite from the first game and it's a shame to see his excellent voice actor gone. Hey, the character remains. Oh boy, okay, this is a tricky one. These days, I think when someone says a game or something animated isn't for kids, it needs to have a bucket full of swearing and sex and all that stuff, and that's just wrong. But for a game titling itself as The Next Chapter in Fear, and a new installment in a horror franchise, it's not exactly a very horrifying experience, is it? Security Breach is a game that is undoubtedly, undeniably for kids. And even as big as fans would find it difficult to call it scary, more so tense, and I guess it can be? Even that one section with the endos, like that is the one part I will give SB, that was freaky in a good way. But other than that? The Pizzaplex is a wide open, brightly lit location, the animatronics are mostly shiny and non-threatening, and you have the chaperone Freddy for the majority of time throughout. But it's more than that. In fact, it seems like the game's been watered down significantly in the last year or two. Official posters for Security Breach show Vanny wielding a knife that's nowhere to be seen in game, there's a cut line from Freddy mentioning Gregory bleeding, little things, you know? It's not like the FNAF games were pinnacles of horror before now, most of the major darkness took place via 8-bit cutscenes letting the viewer fill in the blanks, but this really was their chance to let loose. And I think it's clear to everyone that they decidedly did not. Dark Revival on the other hand? The game managed to strike an excellent balance, a heavy dosage of darkness of course, helped by the wonderful music and environments. The Egg World is one where you're always on edge, where there might be far away screaming or some kind of new creature just around the corner, but if we're talking specific moments, how about your main character getting their legs fucking bitten off? Like, yes, I know, it's ink, not blood, but it's still pretty shocking to see their bones poking out their stumps in a game like this. Beyond that, it's it's very clear just how much Dark Revival is trying to be a properly frightening horror game, and you know what? The majority of the time it succeeds. The Butcher Gang are actually a threat to making full use of their horrifying designs. The Keepers are an excellent replacement for the one genuinely scary enemy in the first game. And of course, Slicer and the Ink Demon both install great genuine terror, albeit in very different ways throughout the entire game. Do the words of the demons sometimes come off as a little cheesy from how hard they're trying to make them imposing? Sometimes, yes. But I'd much, much rather have them trying too hard than not at all.
I'm still very curious as to what the future holds for both of these franchises. I mean, hey, free stuff. What more can I ask for? I mean, you, you, you could like and subscribe, or just like, or just subscribe. I, I, I wouldn't mind at all. That would, that would be quite nice, actually. Okay, thank you. That being said, despite it being such a massive step up for the FNAF series in terms of being, you know, a full-on 3D roaming game, I can't help but feel like Security Breach is also a step back in every other way after what's been built up previously. Meanwhile, Benty's never looked better, and after so long waiting, I can't deny how happy it makes me that the Dark Revival has been such an, albeit not perfect, orange slam dunk. Like, I can call myself a Bendy fan and only feel mild amounts of pain. It's amazing! Anyway, see you all next time. 2023 is going to be big for this channel. I mean it.